Welcome again, Liberating Faith Studies students. I am your dearest servant, uh, Brother Pastor Dale uh, in Iowa. And today we begin a new series of lessons. I don't have long before you today, but I'm asking you, Amy, I'm asking y'all to like and subscribe. And I want you to share this content as well. Uh, March 5th, 2023, the prodigal son, the lesson scripture today is Luke 15, 11 through 32. And the focus scripture is Luke 15, 11 through 24. And the key verse, the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no uh, longer worthy to be called your son. And we understand uh, just a, a, a 30, 000, or 70,000 foot view of this text, a macro view, because uh, I want to provide you a, a cultural and historical background here is that this son went to his father. He's a younger son. He went to his father. He demanded his inheritance early, obviously. And he went off. The father gave it to him, let him go. He went off into a far country and he squandered it. We all know it, uh, the story of the prodigal son. But the other part of that, uh, saints of the Most High God, is that the son came to his senses, got shame, came to his senses, humbled himself and went back to his father's house. And he repented before his father. So that's the cultural, uh, that's the historical cultural background. Let me see, uh, read these uh, verses, Luke 15. I'm just going to read a few of them because there's something that you have to see here. And I'm going to lift up out of this text for you that I guarantee you haven't heard. You did not know. <laughs> and I know because I just got the revelation sitting here, right? Luke 15, 11 through 24. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, a younger son of him said, father, Give me the give me the share of uh, your property that will belong to me, his inheritance. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property uh, in dissolute or foul living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out. Uh, to one of the citizens of that country, sent him to feed his pigs. And if you know uh, the Jewish kosher diet, uh, uh, dietary laws and that, Jesus inserted this in here because that would certainly drive home the point of what he was saying. Uh, he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's uh, hired hands? And I'm gonna stop there because the first part of this, I want to drive home today to you, Liberating Faith uh, Sunday school students, is this, is that one of the greatest missed lessons here that you have to, that I don't want you to leave here without, sure, he demanded his stuff to go, but one of the greatest missed lessons that you did not know and you should grab onto is this. This kid went to his father and demanded an inheritance that he was not ready to receive. And the, the big idea, the bigger idea there is this, is that by the way he demanded his inheritance showed he was not ready to properly execute and live with that inheritance. And a lot of times I'm saying is that what happened after that would should have been known and would have been guessed by the way he set out on his journey. So when you, and I'm saying that because when you go to our father in the name of Jesus and you are quasi demanding something from him, that could show, and it does show that you are not ready to receive the inheritance that God has for you. Because what I've found is this, whatever I, over the last, oh, my entire work, secular work, career, which is included mostly nonprofit work, school districts, uh, homeless shelters, radio stations. It's very basically included nonprofit work. And, but, but what I, and I didn't set out to do that, but what I have found out is the reality was whatever God gave me and I inherited, I was prepared to receive it. I didn't, I never even had to go to him and say, God, can you give me blah, blah, blah. these jobs is literally dropped in my lap, high paying. I, I didn't have education at the time. They just kind of dropped in my lap. Right. And I know it's God. I, I know it's absolutely it was absolutely him because he always positions me in places to receive an inheritance that I did not work for. I could not have prepared for and I was not qualified for. But he dropped it in my lap. Anyway, I told my testimony to people always is this, 
is that when God wants me to give me an inheritance, he drops it in my lap. I'm not saying you should not pray for that. But what I am saying is when 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 God knows you are prepared, not when you think you are prepared to receive your inheritance, he will literally drop it in your lap. Now, with me, I didn't necessarily have to go to him for that. He knew what I needed and he gave it to me. Literally one job, the, the highest paying gig I ever had. If I didn't take, I was in this organization, right? I was at this nonprofit and the vice president next to the CEO came to me. And he said, Ryan, he said, I want to, I want to promote you to this. And this, this was like 13, 14 million dollars with hard assets and cash. 13, 14, 15 million dollars in account responsibility, property, 96,000 square feet, almost 160 rentable rooms. Uh, it was a transitional housing shelter for homeless families. It was, it was the size, it was like this huge property, the size, uh, of uh, a campus, a small college camp. I mean, it was huge. And I said, no, I'm good. You know, in this position I am. And he told me this, and this is how God works. This is the inheritance. This is how God works. He said, Brian, if you don't take this job, I'm going to fire you because I've already given your old job to someone else. I said, well, you got to do what you got to do, man. But I'm not interested in that. And he went on and he actually shared the love of Jesus with me and said, Brian, and he was like, and, and he explained, you know, he, he was an older guy. He, he was an older guy. I won't say more about word, versed in the word, but certainly the wisdom of the word at that time. And I went and accepted the position, not because I thought he was going to fire me, because I told him to do what you got to do. But I literally got threatened to fire unless I received my inheritance that God had for me. And I know it was because I had to do some work a little bit later uh, to weed some things out of that organization. And it was God. So I'm saying today, your inheritance is something you're not going to have to cheat, lie, and steal for. You don't have to do it. God will drop it into your lap. But what you can't do is go to him demanding an inheritance, quasi demanding. God, where you at? When you going to do this? That's demanding an inheritance you're not ready for. And here's how I know. Because if you go to him like that, you've already proved you're not ready to receive that inheritance. Amen. Now, reading more, uh, Luke eleven seventeen. 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I sinned against you before you heaven and earth. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. He set off and he went to his father. But his father saw him coming afar off and his father had him, uh, his servants prepare stuff or his father kissed him and his servants prepare stuff. And then uh, they had a banquet. They celebrated him coming back. So the point here is I lift that up out of the text before we go to the introduction here today, saints, is that don't let the devil shame you out of your father God's in, uh, out of your inheritance first by demanding something you ain't ready for. But don't let when you even if you do remember, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, it was interesting because here his father saw him coming back afar off. He said what he was going to say to his father before he arrived, but his father saw him coming and he didn't even have to say that to his father. He just, his father just kissed him, fell on him. So I'm saying, God, see, God knows you're coming, right? So what I'm saying to you, don't forget that the devil, yes, you can, you can get into a place of sin, demand something you aren't ready for, take that, leave, mess it up, but don't be too ashamed to start heading back to your father's house. Saints, I once asked God, I was doing this study. And I wanted to know how far Lucifer had fallen. I wanted to know the literal distance between eternity and spatial or temporal time, the time we live in, right? I didn't know if it was light years, like light travels, six trillion miles in a year. I didn't know if it was like 30 trillion light years or 100 quadrillion miles from heaven to earth. I didn't know what that distance was. Ask God. God, it was something amazing. He said, it doesn't matter how far anybody fall, uh, how far you fall. It's the distance back to me, which is the cross of Jesus. Woo. The distance between you and getting back to God is a phone call away. Jesus on the main line. That's literally true. So I'm saying that to point out, saints, that he's going to see you coming afar off. That journey back to God may seem far because you're so ashamed and you're so cast down. But call on the name of Jesus. Introduction. The story of the prodigal son is well known. However, does the title completely characterize the depth of this parable? What is truly at the heart of this tale? Saying tale here makes it seem as if it may not be true. 
And the reality is, and even in a standard lesson, he was saying, like, it wasn't true, basically. And we don't know if it was true. We don't know if parables were based on Jesus's eternal or temporal time experience. Some of that stuff may seem way out there, but you have to remember Jesus himself said that he came down from heaven. Jesus himself, the Bible says, in the many games of the word, the words with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said, uh, if you see me, you've seen the father. So Jesus exists in spatial, existed in spatial and eternal time. So we don't know if parables are stories that happened or they're just examples that Jesus said. So I'm saying this doctrinally and hermeneutically. So we understand language matters. Saying that this is a tale could make it seem like it's a fairy tale. Is it too much to believe that, that Jesus could have been um, watching or directly involved in the story of Abraham, of the story of uh, the rich man, the, the poor man and Lazarus. Abra uh, Lazarus died and he was in Abraham's bosom and the rich man was burning in hell. And there was a gulf between them. And Jesus was telling the stories if he'd been there. Is it too much to believe that Jesus, who said he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending in the book of Revelations, that he could have been there watching that? after? So all I'm saying, saints, doctrinally, we do not know if parables are true or not. I don't care what commentaries, online commentaries say. I don't care what any of these, these, these Bible colleges say, these seminaries say. They don't know if Jesus, these were actual uh, events or if Jesus was just saying this stuff in order to get a point across. I personally struggle with the latter because the Bible says no liars of the truth, right? And if Jesus said a story, even if it was well-meaning and it was not true and it was fiction, another word for fiction is lie. And we continue. Does the parable, does this parable sim, uh, simply reflect the reckless lifestyle of an unappreciative, immature young man who leaves the blessings of his family and loving father to squander and waste his inheritance? Is the lesson about the need for good stewardship, humility, and repentance? Is this narrative employing readers who have benefited from their privilege to recognize the strong, forgiving hand of God in their life? It wants a reader to resist temptation that led to ingratitude. This story represents these things and more. It is about the father who has a deep and doing love for his son. It is a tale of someone who looks past the hurt and pain inflicted by a loved one and the parental enduring love that is willing and forgiving. Now, when we uh, before we go to the telling of the Bible story, saints, we also have to realize the other part of that. This big idea in this uh, text today in our liberating faith AME lesson here today is that no matter again what you've done, if you yet breathe. God is welcoming, ready and welcoming you back. Now, he already knows if you're going to make it back or not. But the reality is sometimes we do things, even as believers, we know we shouldn't have do, said things. We know we should have said thought things or dwelled on things too long uh, psychologically that we were not, uh, we shouldn't have done. But I tell you, the Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So saints of God, I want you to say out loud that the devil is a lie today. And whatever you've done as this prodigal son's father was welcome him back, seen coming afar off and was preparing for him to come back. God is preparing for you to come back. You just have to come back. And again, the distance back doesn't matter. The distance is a cry away, a moan in the spirit even. Now you may say, how have you been able to make it back to church? You don't need to make it back to some commercial building to make it back to Jesus because you can call on his name right where you at. And I said it now, say it again. You know, the, the time the altar is open and, and the church doors are open and this, you ain't got to wait for that to come to the Lord. You can come to the Lord right where you at now. If you want to grow in him, you need you need to find a, a group to worship with fellow believers, church home, whatever you want to call it. But you can call on him right where you're at for forgiveness. I'm assuming you found this lesson because you are a mature Christian. And some of you won't find this that you're struggling for something right now or struggling with something right now. Like this indicates to us today. God is just a moan away. Amen. Telling the Bible story. The 15th chapter of Luke begins with Jesus teaching a collection of parables and observers who are described as tax collectors and sinners. 
the text notes that Pharisees and scribes are also present and critically object to Jesus' interaction with these people. As a result, Jesus uses this as an opportunity to teach about God's redemptive love and his intentions to save lost souls. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming you are a believer. I want to use that and lift up out of here this thought for you before I move on uh, to our case study. Is there someone that uh, you probably should be focusing on that may not be in church, may not be clean, that you become disgusted with and like these scribes and Pharisees don't believe that you should be dealing with right now as a believer? Who is that person? Do you know someone that's struggling? Maybe they don't look right. Maybe they don't dress right. Uh, maybe they need a bath. They need some food that you avoid or you walk around, right? That like in story of the Good Samaritan that you should go to. Who is that person? You need to love them because G if Jesus went to them, you should too. Amen. Life application. Parents face many challenges raising children in the complex world in which we live. Young people are exposed to the greater risks and compromising situations today. They're getting it from all ends, y'all. They have a device that brings the world to their doorstep. You and I used to have to go to libraries. Uh, if we wanted to use a phone, we had to stop at a corner and put a nick or a quarter in or whatever that number was. But they have, they can be right in your house and bring things in your house that you object to because they have easy access to social media platforms in the world in a way we never did. Exposing children to sound moral principles is available through strong Christian communities that promote Bible studies, church schools, and spiritually empowered activities. These are crucial options for raising generations. In addition, adults may also be lured into promiscuous behavior that can impact homes and families. The church must remain relevant to address these issues with sound teaching uh, to a place for healing and reconciliation. And as I uh, uh, close today, saying, we have to understand that um, sound, may, being relevant does not mean compromising. Because the teachings of Jesus in the Bible are just as irrelevant today as they were then. Now, we ha must use different tools to get the word out. Um, I'm sitting in front of you on video. I mean, your grandmama or even your mama, if they went on before all this was uh, possible, can you imagine putting this in front of them? <laughs> mama, hear your pastor. <laughs> can you imagine putting that in front of them? So I I'm saying that we, can re we must remain relevant, but that doesn't mean compromising. And too often we've done that. We have compromised sound teaching. And I know we have because you can see it in our communities with our black men killing one another with 78% of our, 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 our girls growing up to be single mothers. We've compromised sound teaching in order to remain relevant. I mean, today we have uh, choir directors and these type of people that are having children with their friends and acting as if that's okay and throwing baby showers and churches saying, yeah, this is great. We've compromised on teaching and wonder why our community is existing in such an unsound spiritual place. So we have to remain relevant, but the way we remain relevant is by preaching truth and not backing off it. God is waiting for you. God is waiting for your child. God is waiting for you to come back to him. He's waiting for those people I just described to you to come back to him. Don't let the enemy shame you out of God's presence today and just know that he loves you and that you might have done received something you wasn't ready for and squandered it in the spirit or even physically. But your father, God, is waiting afar off in the name of Jesus for you to come back. So be it.